Reinforcement learning, or RL, is one of the three main subfields in machine learning, the other two of course being supervised learning and unsupervised learning. RL agents learn through trial and error by interacting with their environments and attempting to maximize total rewards, kind of like what humans and animals do. RL is a complex and deep field, but I want to give you a brief overview of how it works along with some terminology that you should probably be familiar with. Additionally, I'll work through this simple example of training an agent to balance a pole attached to a cart that can only move side to side. We'll use two popular RL frameworks to accomplish this. I'll also give you a challenge to solve a slightly more complicated problem in a similar environment. But first, let's jump into history and and a little bit of theory. Creating optimal control algorithms dates back to the 1950s with Richard Bellman extending the work of Hamilton and Jacobi from the 1800s. However, modern RL has only started seeing popularity in the 1980s when researchers began connecting the work of Richard Bellman to the biology-inspired research into trial and error learning. Thanks to that, RL has seen a number of notable successes in the past few years. For example, in 2013, a group of researchers from Google's DeepMind showed that RL agents could learn to play simple Atari games by directly using the pixels that make up the game's screen as the observation. OpenAI has made impressive contributions to RL, especially in the field of robotics where robots can learn to carefully handle objects on their own. Object manipulation has historically been tricky for AI and real-life robots. In 2016, DeepMind made history again by beating the world's best Go player, Lee Sedol, using their AlphaGo RL agent. AlphaGo was later generalized to AlphaZero to play chess and Shogi in addition to Go, but we're going to start with something much simpler. This is cart pole, one of the classic introductory control problems used in reinforcement learning. It's a virtual environment representing a pole that can rotate around an axis on one end. That end of the pole is attached to a cart, which is just a black rectangle in this simulation, so you'll have to use your imagination. You can't directly interact with the pole. However, you can move the cart left and right. By doing so, you can indirectly affect how the pole spins about the axis. The goal is to make the pole stay upright for as long as possible. It's much like trying to balance a pencil in the palm of your hand with the only point of contact being the eraser. We refer to this setup as the environment. The environment is anything that our agent interacts with and learns from. It can be a control simulation like this, a board game, a video game, or even the real world. Often, the more we constrain the environment, the easier it is for the agent to learn. As the programmer, we have to help the agent learn. First, we create an interpreter that can extract meaningful features from the environment as well as provide rewards to incentivize or punish the agent. The agent is the piece of software that makes decisions. Note that it does not interact directly with the environment. It learns to make decisions based on current and past observations about the environment, as well as previously received rewards. From there, it produces an action decision. That action is then carried out, which allows the AI to interact with the environment. The environment changes as a result, and the cycle continues, with a new observation and rewards being sent to the agent. It's easy to imagine this being similar to how we humans work. Our sensory organs, like eyes and ears, provide meaningful interpretations of the environment to our brains. Rewards come in the form of hormones like serotonin and endorphins, as well as the various emotions we feel. Over time, we learn habits and patterns that attempt to maximize these rewards. In our cart pole simulation, our observation is a simple collection of four numbers, cart position, cart velocity, pole angle, and pole angular velocity. Note that these are continuous values that can be any number within an acceptable range. In more complex AI agents, such as those that learn to play video games, this observation might be an array of pixel values that make up the current visible frame of the game. 
Next, our reward is also quite simple. We're going to reward a positive 1 for each time step that the pole stays upright between two angles, positive and negative 12 degrees, where 0 degrees is the pole in the upright position. The agent must decide between two possible actions, move the cart left or move the cart right. This is a discrete action space. We can't decide how much to move the cart by. The amount moved is set within the environment. Once the agent decides what to do, our interacting code will tell the environment which way to move the cart. Additionally, time is divided up into discrete chunks. Each chunk or step is one round of take observation and reward, make a decision, and take the action. In this case, each step is a few milliseconds. We can easily do this simulation at about 30 frames per second, where each frame corresponds to a single time step. We will use the Ferrama Foundation library, known as Gymnasium, to act as our interpreter and to control the environment. In fact, Gymnasium comes with a number of virtual environments for us to use, including Cartpole. We will use an algorithm in Stable Baselines 3 to train our agent. Stable Baselines 3 is a wrapper library for the various reinforcement learning algorithms maintained by OpenAI. It makes training an agent much easier, as we don't have to write a lot of algorithm code ourselves. Let's see how to set up our Gymnasium cart pull environment and interact with it in code. Head to gymnasium.ferama.org if you'd like to check out the Gymnasium documentation. Note that Gymnasium is a fork of the original OpenAI Gym library, so sometimes you might come across some literature or tutorials that talk about OpenAI Gym. This Gymnasium fork is now considered the official standard API for reinforcement learning for creating things like environments. It comes with a number of off-the-shelf environments, which you can see how to make here. We're going to be using Cartpole under Classic Control. There's a number of other environments available, including things like Atari games. So I recommend reading through this if you'd like to learn more about Gymnasium. Next, Head to stablebaselines3.readthedocs.io to learn about stable baselines. This is the collection of reinforcement learning algorithms that we will be looking at. Note that all of this is open source, so you can click on the GitHub link to see the source code for stable baselines 3. And there's something similar for Gymnasium. Stable Baselines is maintained by the German Aerospace Center in the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics. Now let's see how to use both of these, starting with Gymnasium, to create and train an RL agent. Head to colab.research.google.com. We're going to be using Colab as it allows us to create a consistent development environment, and you don't need to worry about installing all of these different packages on your own host machine. Note that there is a timeout limit for Colab, and you don't get access to a lot of things like uh, accelerators and GPUs for training long periods of time. This is great for a quick demo, but if you're going to be training much more difficult RL agents or more complex RL agents, you're going to want access to things like GPU clusters and Colab simply won't cut it anymore. That is unless, of course, you pay the subscription for Colab. The first thing you'll want to do is install Gymnasium and Stable Baselines 3. Note that I'm adding the extra packages that come along with Stable Baselines as that has some of the training algorithms that we need. It's good to just install those anyway. The other thing to note is that I'm tying this to a specific version for each of these packages. I find that both packages are very research oriented and their interface changes all the time. So if you are using an older version of Gymnasium, it might not work with a newer version of Stable Baselines because that expects certain functions to be present when you start creating environments or environment wrappers. These are two versions that I have found work together. The 0.28.1 for Gymnasium and the 2.0.0 Alpha 1 release for Stable Baselines 3, or the A1 release. They happen to work together. Feel free to try different versions, but if you run into any problems, it's probably a version mismatch. We'll import Gymnasium with the short name of Jim. This allows you to do a drop-in replacement of the OpenAI Jim package. 
We'll also import stable baselines 3 as SB3, and we'll get the ever popular matplotlib as well as OpenCV, which is CV2. We need CV2 or OpenCV because we're going to be doing frame captures from our environment so we can watch this play out in a recorded video. Colab does not have a great way to display the environment from Gymnasium, so we need to capture it in the video, download the video, and play it. It's not the best way to work with it, but it works well for specifically Colab. Finally, I like to check specific versions of some of my packages, so I'm going to print out the Jim and OpenCV versions. Don't worry about some of those deprecation warnings for now, as long as we're using specific known good package versions. And you can see here, I'm using 0.28.1 for Jim and 4.7.0 for OpenCV. Next, we're going to call the make function within the Jim package and tell it we want to create the cart pole v1 environment. This is a pre-made cart pole environment. Note that you can also create your own environments. If you're curious about this, check out my previous video where I created a gymnasium environment that wrapped around interacting with the mouse and keyboard in order to play the game Quop. In addition to specifying the environment, we're also going to specify the render mode. We normally don't need to set the render mode if we're just training an agent, but because we want to watch the environment, we're going to output a red, green, blue array that we can then use inside of OpenCV to save to a video. Next, let's reset our environment. We do that by calling the reset method within the environment object that we created. When we call that, we're going to immediately get a new observation and some info. The observation should line up with the observation data we saw inside of the cart pole documentation. So if we head to gymnasium.forama.org, we can go down to our classic control, go to cart pole, and sure enough, here's the observation space. It is four floating point values, and you can scroll down to learn more about the observation space. The first value is cart position, then cart velocity, pole angle, and pole angular velocity. You can see the expected minimum and maximums for each of these. In fact, these values should never be outside of these ranges. The info is just some extra information about the environment. This might be like a score in a video game if it's not directly tied to, say, a reward, uh, maybe your frames per second or something to that effect. For this simple environment, we don't have any info being returned to us, so it's just nothing. Once we've reset the environment, we can then grab a frame from that environment, assuming that the rendering method is actually filled out in that particular environment. You might, for example, create a custom environment where rendering does nothing, but in this case, that method does actually return a frame for us. It is an array of 400 by 600 and three channels, and we can use matplotlib to show that array. In this case, it's just the cart and the pole. Note that rendering is not the observation, at least in this case. The observation is the collection of four values that point to the cart's position and velocity, as well as the pole's position and velocity, at least for angular. The rendering is a collection of pixels that we can display. In some cases, like maybe Atari games, the rendering might be or related to the observation if the observation, say, is a collection of pixels, in which case the rendering might be the same. But don't assume that rendering is the same as the observation. It's just a way for us to visualize what's going on inside that environment. To demonstrate how to work with the observation and action spaces, we're going to print both spaces out and then we're going to sample a random drawing from those spaces. So first up is the observation space. This is an object that shows you the bounding ranges and some more information about what's acceptable for the observation space. For example, you can see how it goes from negative 4.8 to positive 4.8 for the cart position. Sure enough, that lines up with what we're reading here. It goes from some large negative value to some large positive value, which is close enough to minus infinity to infinity. It goes from minus 
to positive 0.418, and that's in radians for the pole angle. And then once again, basically minus infinity to infinity for the pole angular velocity. The other information, it says that there are four values, and these are given as floating point, 32-bit floating point values. The action space is discrete. There are two possible actions, which is to move the cart left and move the cart right. And these should just be the values 0 and 1. If we choose randomly from the observation space, you should get four values that are in between these ranges. And then choosing randomly from the action space, you're going to get either 0 or 1. So if we run this multiple times, you can see that the observation space is different. And sure enough, we got a different random action. Next, we're going to take a step in our environment. Taking a step is an important part of reinforcement learning where we take a step, see what rewards we get, see what the new observation is, and we train our agent to take that information in and do something with it. In this case, ideally predicted action. Step expects an action as a parameter, so we're just going to give it action zero. There's only two actions available, action zero, action one, for this particular environment. So we're going to pass it action zero. It's going to perform the step, basically push the cart left or right, and it's going to give us a new observation, a new reward. It's going to tell us whether the episode is terminated or truncated. Terminated means it's over. We lost the game or won the game. Truncated means we didn't win or lose or ended up in an ending state, but it's something like a timeout happened. So we may or may not see a reward from that. And then finally, the info, which is the same as we saw earlier with the reset. I'm going to print out the observation reward and if we're terminated, and then we're going to render the frame just like we did earlier. So here's more or less the starting position. Actually, I take that back. Here's the starting position, and it's moved a little bit. We've pushed the cart a little bit to the left because we gave it zero. And here's the new observation. Here's the reward we got because we're still within the bounds of the pole. In this case, we're between minus 2.4 and 2.4 for the cart position. And the pole is between about negative 0.21 and 0.21 radians. So we're still within those ranges, so we get that one reward. And it has not been terminated nor truncated, so this is coming back as false. Let's run this a few times and see what happens to that pole. I'm going to keep running it. Sure enough, you see the pole is straight as we're pushing the cart to the left. We're going to keep going, and you see that pole start to tilt to the right. So we're going to keep going here. And you see it start to fall. And at some point, it's going to pass that 0.21 radian threshold. And here you go. Terminated is true. We've reached that threshold. We've reached the end state. I'm assuming that was picked because it's essentially unrecoverable to rebalance the pole, at least with this environment. And if you try to run it again, you're going to get this warning. You're trying to call step even though this environment has terminated. So we are done. In this case, our training algorithm or whatever we're writing should see that terminated or truncated is true and reset the environment. Next up, we want to write a very simple function that takes in an environment and a given model, in this case, more or less, think agent, and it's going to run that environment using whatever that model or agent decides to do based on the observations and the given actions. If we provide a way to record it, it will record the frames in a video for us, and we can set some sort of text on that video by passing in a message here. We're going to reset our environment whenever we call this function. We're going to use that reset method that we saw earlier. We're going to grab a frame, even if we don't necessarily do anything with that frame. And we're going to reset our episode length and episode total rewards counters. Then we're going to run the episode until complete. In this case, we see terminate or truncate be set to true. Then we're going to call model.predict, and we're going to send it an observation. Think of the model in this case as our agent. It takes in an observation and it's going to predict an action that it thinks we should perform. If we go back to the stable baselines documentation, and we just 
pick one of these algorithms, it doesn't really matter. Actually, HER is not the one we want to look at because that's more or less an add-on to other algorithms. But let's take SAC, the soft actor critic. Don't worry about what these algorithms mean quite yet. We'll go through the one we plan to use for this. What I want to point out here is that predict method. All of these algorithms create a model that have this predict method. We need to give it an observation plus some other parameters, and it's going to return the model's action as well as the next states or hidden states, which is used in recurrent policies. We do not care about this part. We just need the action. Since it returns two different values, we're going to store that action into the action variable, and we're just going to throw away that next state because we don't care about it for our purposes. Next, we're going to take a step using the action that was given to us by that predict method, and then we're going to record or store the outcome or the return values from that method. In this case, the observation, reward, whether we terminated or truncated, and any info which shouldn't be a whole lot in our case. We will also record or update our episode total reward. That's useful for debugging later when we want to see how well our policy is performing. Next, if that video parameter is set, we're going to record the rendered frame from our environment into a video. We're just going to keep stacking the frames one on top of the other so that it creates a video. We're first going to get that frame by calling environment.render. We're then going to convert the color from RGB to BGR because gymnasium outputs red, green, blue, the channels in that order, and OpenCV likes to work in blue, green, red, so we need to convert those, just change the channel order. Then we're going to add text to the image. In this case, it helps us with debugging or telling us what is going on in that particular video, say, for example, which training episode we are on. To add the text, we pass in the image, we tell it what text to add, we set the origin of text, this is somewhere near the top, give it some room for the text. We're going to use one of the built-in OpenCV fonts, in this case, the Hershey Simplex font. We're going to scale it, just scale of one. We're going to change the color to black, change the line thickness to two, and we're going to use the AA line type. These are just pretty standard defaults I looked up that make for readable text. Finally, we're going to call video.write. We need to pass in a video object Assuming this is one of those OpenCV video types, we're going to call the dot write method and it just adds the frame to that video. Next, we're going to increase our step counter so that we know how many steps we take in this episode. Finally, if we see terminated or truncated set to true, we are just going to exit this function and return our totaled episode length as well as the episode total reward. In order to test this, we're going to create a dummy model much in the same vein as one of our stable baselines model. We're obviously not going to implement all of this because we're just going to be using the object that comes out of this training later in order to make predictions. But we are going to first save our environment. So environment gets passed in. We set it as a class member. Then we're going to implement that predict method. In this case, it's just going to select a random sample from the action space for our purposes, for this particular environment, it's just going to be zero or one. It's going to return that action and return none, which as you saw, should be the next hidden state, but we're not using that. So just return none here. Next, we're going to try running our environment with this very basic dummy model that just predicts random actions. To do that, we need to set up our video recorder so that we can see what's happening. Let's set the frames per second to 30. That's fairly arbitrary. Then in order for the OpenCV video writer to work, we need to specify the type of writer to use and where to store this, basically what container to use. And um, it's going to pick an encoder based on that. We're going to use the MP4V video writer. OpenCV does this in a little funky way where it wants you to specify the what they call the 4CC. It's a four character designator in order to specify the type of video writer. So we're just going to set that here, and we're going to give it this file name of 1-random.mp4. Remember that we grabbed a frame earlier in a previous cell, and we're going to use that to calculate the resolution. 
Note that the first value in shape is the height when we're talking about images, and the second value is the width. So that's why we're doing dot shape one and dot shape zero for width and height respectively. Then we finally create the video writer itself using OpenCV. We pass in the file name, that four character designator for what type of video to create, the frames per second, and the resolution, which is width by height. Then we're gonna run a few episodes, this case five episodes, with the environment and that dummy model that just picks random actions. So we'll create that dummy model by instantiating an object of our dummy model class and passing it the environment that we created earlier. Then we're just gonna run a simple for loop for five episodes. We're going to run that test model function we just created. We're gonna pass in the environment, the dummy model, a handle to the video object, and what text we want to appear in that video. In this case, we're gonna write random to show that this is the random policy and the episode number. And finally, we will print out the episode, how long that episode ran for, the number of steps, as well as the total reward that was obtained. And super important, we need to release the video object so that the file actually gets closed out and created, and then we can download and watch it. So let's run this and see what happens. This should be pretty quick. Sure enough, here's our five episodes. There were some varying lengths and some varying rewards. Now, if we look in our files, we should see one randommp 4 That was the video that was written to with all of these frames. Let's download that. And as you can see with the dash seven, I've done this a number of times. And let's bring VLC over here and let's play this. I'll play it one more time. So you can see random the text we added and then the episode number as the cart was moving back and forth randomly with the pole falling over. Now that we have our environment built and we can interact with our environment, let's go back to a little bit of theory so we can see how to use reinforcement learning to train an algorithm to solve this for us. Reinforcement learning is built around the concept of a Markov decision process, or MDP, which is a way to model decision-making in discrete time slices. At any given time, we assume that our environment, or at least what we can observe from the environment, is some state. It's often easiest to think about states as being discrete, for example, a particular configuration of pieces in a game of chess. However, this is often infeasible for computers, so we use approximations, or let states be continuous, as we do for our cart pole problem. From any given state, we must take one action, but we might have several possible actions to choose from. In a finite state machine, this would immediately move us to the next state. However, in an MDP, moving to another state from a given action is not guaranteed. Each action has one or more possible transitions to other states, which we cannot control. This models the uncertainty of the environment. For example, we might choose the action of grabbing our umbrella, but we can't control what the weather will do. Either way, we still likely end up in the dry state. MDPs allow us to model a large number of states, actions, and their transition dynamics. But remember, these transitions might be probabilistic. For example, imagine that you are in state D. I like to imagine myself physically standing in a circle looking out at my possible actions. In this case, there's only one possible action, but I could still end up in state A, state B, or state E completely randomly. These transition probabilities must add up to one, so for example, it might be a 10% probability to go to A, 70% probability to go to B, and 20% probability to go to E. Now, let's break down that transition process even further. I've renamed the states, so don't think we're in the same MDP as before. This is just a transition example from a different MDP. In this case, we can assume we arrived here from some other state action pair. A state action pair is the combination of taking a particular action from a particular state, such as taking action A1 from state S0. We have three possible actions we can take, A0, A1, and A2. We're in state zero, and we want to figure out which action we should perform. Like we saw before, each action can have multiple transitions to future states. Whenever we move through a transition, we obtain a reward from the environment. 
As we saw, the reward is usually something that's designed by the programmer. For example, taking action 0 from state 0 has three possible transitions, each with its own unique reward, which I've labeled R00, R01, and R02. Note that you can also have different rewards from a single state action pair, even though the transition is to the same state. In this case, choosing action 2 from state 0 results in one of two possible rewards, but you'll end up in state 3 regardless. Once again, this represents uncertainty in the environment. From whatever your next state is, whether that's state 1, 2, or 3, you can then choose another action to continue traversing the MDP. But let's come back to state 0. We still need to know which action to choose. If we always demanded immediate gratification, this choice would be easy. Just take whatever action provides the highest expected reward. However, life's not like that, and we want to build an AI that can learn to make decisions with delayed gratification. That means taking the current possible rewards into account along with possible future rewards based on our actions. This is where things get interesting. Let's shrink our example MDP diagram so we can have some space to write. A big question is, what is the expected value of my current state given a particular policy? A policy is the function we use to select an action given a particular state, and it's denoted by the function pi of a given s. This could be a random policy, where the action is chosen randomly. Probably not an optimal strategy, but it can sometimes be a good starting point or a way to explore new actions. You might also do something like a lookup table to determine which action to take based on your state. Or you might use something more complex, like a neural network, that takes state values as inputs and outputs a suggested action. This scary-looking equation calculates the expected return for a given state under a given policy. In other words, we want to know how good our current state is based on future rewards over all the actions we could possibly take. To compute this, we sum over all the actions. In the example, that's just a0, a1, and a2. We weight the actions by using the policy's probabilities of selecting each action. For each action, we then sum over all the possible reward transitions that can result from that action. This might be R00, R01, and R02 if you select A0. There is a probability for each transition and reward, so we sum over all of those probabilities. In the diagram below, that would mean summing over all the probabilities associated with the blue arrows. Finally, we multiply by the reward associated with that transition added to a discounted expected return for the next state. The discount factor, gamma, is between 0 and 1. It allows us to set future rewards as less valuable than the current possible rewards. Often you'll see this set to something between 0.9 and 0.99, which means future rewards are only slightly less valuable than the current reward. S prime refers to the next state. In this example, it would be S1, S2, or S3. Note that this equation is recursive. To complete the computation, you need to know the expected return of the next states. So you'd follow the same procedure, substituting S prime for the S in this equation, and calculating the expected return from that state. You'd continue doing that until you reached the end of the MDP, just to calculate the expected return for the current state. As you can imagine, this quickly becomes complicated, especially for MDPs that go on forever. This is known as the Bellman equation for the state value function. A quick note, the term return refers to the total discounted rewards from the current time step and state. In this case, it would be the reward plus the discounted future rewards from S0. Now, what would happen if, instead of looking outward from our current state, we considered returns from a point in time just after selecting our action? We would rewrite the Bellman equation as follows. Here, we want to know the expected value for a given state and a given action, which is also known as a state-action pair. This is given by the function q sub pi of s and a, 
To calculate this, we'd first sum over all the reward transition paths looking out from that action. We would sum the probabilities of moving to the next state, S prime, and receiving a particular reward, R, just like we did with the previous equation. Likewise, we would multiply that probability by the reward added to the future discounted rewards to create a weighted sum. However, we would need to apply the discount factor to the expected return from the next state, S prime. We can calculate that in terms of Q sub pi by first summing over all the next actions. Each action would contain the probability of selecting that action as given by our policy. We would multiply that action probability by the expected return for the given future state action pair. This is known as the Bellman equation for the action value function, as we're trying to calculate the total return after an action instead of for a particular state. It's another way to evaluate the expected return from within a Markov decision process. So why do we care about all these rather complicated equations? Well, they form the basis of almost all reinforcement learning. Most algorithms and research for reinforcement learning involve finding a policy, pi, that maximizes the value of every state or every state action pair for a given MDP. These maximized value functions are known as the Bellman optimality equations, and they're denoted V star and Q star. The idea is that once we know the policy that maximizes state or action returns, we can make decisions to perform the most valuable action at any given state. In turn, this means that our agent has learned the most optimal decision-making process for the task at hand. However, like with most machine learning tasks, this is not without difficulties and pitfalls. One of the first difficulties you'll run across in reinforcement learning is the concept of exploration versus exploitation. In most cases, reinforcement learning involves learning about the environment and MDP so that the agent has an understanding of the value of actions and states as well as figuring out an optimal policy. Let's imagine that you're in a particular state, say S0 again. We have a vague idea of what each action will do, the transition probabilities, known as the dynamics, and the rewards we can expect. However, we're not very sure that our understanding of the environment is correct. So, do we go with the action that we think will give us the best possible return? Or do we pick some other action, perhaps at random, in the hopes of finding something that produces a better total return? This is known as exploration. Some of the time, we might have our agent pick a seemingly random action in the hopes of learning more about the environment. As our understanding of the environment gets better, we might choose exploitation more, which means choosing the action according to our policy that promises the best total return. Imagine going to your favorite restaurant and you crack open the menu. Do you order your favorite thing off the menu because you know it'll be good? or? you decide to try something new in the hopes that it will be better, but you know it might also be worse. It's often a mutually exclusive decision that you have to make. Many RL algorithms include ways to explore more at first to learn about the environment and then later shift their resources to exploiting in order to maximize their rewards. I won't dive much more into the math behind reinforcement learning as I want to move on to using the newest algorithms in Python. However, if you want to dig into the math, I highly recommend heading to incompleteideas.net. Go to the link for reinforcement learning and introduction. Here you can find the full RL textbook by Sutton and Bartow, free in PDF format. This is often considered the Bible of RL. It's a heavy read and can take weeks or months to work through, especially if you try all the exercises. You can also find courses on Coursera, Udemy, Hugging Face, and plenty of other sites to help you understand the math behind RL. I'll make sure to add links to a few of them in the description below for you to check out. Now, when it comes to selecting an algorithm to train your agent, I recommend learning a little vocabulary. Most of the early reinforcement learning algorithms were model-based. 
That means the algorithms attempted to learn the transition dynamics and rewards of the Markov decision process. Once you learned those, it required relatively simple math to calculate the optimal policy for each state. However, this did not scale well to environments and MDPs with many states. It also meant trying to remember extraneous information about the environment that doesn't matter, as all we really care about is finding the optimal policy. The alternative is, of course, a model-free algorithm. Here, we don't try to learn the dynamics or the associated rewards. Instead, the agent performs an action, receives a reward, and the policy is updated based on what reward it just received and those from past actions. We don't care to try to model the whole environment. It's a true trial-and-error approach to learning. Most modern RL algorithms are model-free. Something else you might run into is the idea of on-policy versus off-policy algorithms. Let's say we're trying to estimate the value of S0 or of the S0A0 state action pair. When looking at the next state, say S2, if we follow the current policy of estimating out future actions and transitions, this is known as on-policy. Instead, if we use some other policy, like maybe the random policy, to estimate the return, this is known as an off-policy algorithm. For our purposes, we don't really care if the algorithm is on or off policy. We just need to know if a training algorithm is going to work to solve our particular problem. It's mostly a way to classify how algorithms work, but you'll see it talked about in reinforcement learning literature. In all of our examples so far, we have been using a discrete action space. This means that from any given state, we have only whole numbers of actions to choose from. For example, think about an old console video game where you only had up, down, left, right, A and B as possible action inputs. Many reinforcement learning algorithms can only work with discrete action spaces, so keep that in mind when we look at algorithms in a few minutes. Some newer RL algorithms are able to work with continuous action spaces. This means that instead of choosing one of a few actions, you can now specify fractional values for your actions. For example, instead of up, down, left, right, A and B to drive a car, you now have steering wheel angle, accelerator pedal position, and brake pedal position. This, in theory, would allow you better control over a car, as you're working with continuous values instead of discrete button pushes. Note that I've left the reward transitions as discrete paths in this diagram to help contrast it to the discrete action space version. The reality is that rewards come from the environment, so the agent does not really know if the rewards are discrete or continuous. Let's go back to our original reinforcement learning diagram. Just like with our action space, our observation space can also be discrete or continuous. A discrete observation space helps describe the current state using whole numbers. For example, this might be a particular state of a board game, like chess, where one integer fully describes where all the pieces are on the board. The other option is, of course, a continuous observation space. We saw an example of this already with our cart pole environment. For example, the observation space might be negative pi to positive pi radians for the pole angle and an angular velocity of negative infinity to positive infinity. Also note that these observations do not need to be a single dimension. With our cart pole, the angle is one dimension and the velocity is another dimension. We can have as many observation variables, or dimensions, as needed. But note that adding more dimensions makes training more difficult. Selecting the right observations and rewards is very important in reinforcement learning. There are dozens of reinforcement learning algorithms used to train agents, and new methods are being published every year. Let's take a look at some of the modern and popular algorithms. Stable Baselines is a collection of such algorithms. It is a library for Python and plugs in nicely to Gymnasium. On the side, you can see the algorithms that are available. If you click on one, you can read about the types of applications that it might be good for. However, even this can be confusing. 
So I've added these algorithms to a table to make the selection process hopefully a little easier. As I mentioned, new reinforcement learning algorithms are being added quite often. As a result, expect these to change from when I created the table in the middle of 2023. You can see that all of these newer algorithms are model free and can support continuous and discrete observation spaces. Some are on policy and some are off policy. However, that doesn't matter as much as the action space and observation space space values for selecting one to use for a particular application. Our cart pole problem has a continuous observation space but a discrete action space. We can only push the cart left or right by some set amount. As a result, the A2C, DQN, and PPO algorithms should work. You would need to read more about these particular algorithms to learn about the advantages and disadvantages of each. I found another fun way to figure out which reinforcement learning algorithm we should use. We just ask ChatGPT. It turns out GPT-4 is surprisingly knowledgeable about reinforcement learning. Well, at least up to a couple of years ago when it was trained on a snapshot of internet data. Let's ask it, which reinforcement learning algorithm should I use for CartPole? CartPole is a common reinforcement learning problem, so it should have no issue answering this question. If your problem is unique, you may try describing it to ChatGPT along with some information about your action space and observation space, such as whether those need to be continuous or discrete. It gives us several options of algorithms to use. DeepQ Network, or DQN, is a little older, but it's a bit simpler than some of the others. It was made famous thanks to Google DeepMind researchers developing it back in 2013 and using it to successfully play Atari games. I recommend reading the paper to see how this was done. It marked a major leap forward in reinforcement learning as it demonstrated how pixels can be used as direct inputs to such algorithms, similar to how our brains operate with visual information from our eyes. However, we first need to take a step back and look at Q-learning. In Q-learning, we attempt to learn the Q-values of each state-action pair. A common way to do this is with a Q-table. Here, we record all of the Q-values associated with each state and action. As the agent explores the environment and receives rewards, it updates its estimates for the expected return for each state-action pair. Note that we use capital Q here to denote the estimate of lowercase q, which is generally given as the true value for the return. There are a number of ways to estimate these q values, which I won't dive into now. Note that the Bellman equation for the action value function plays a big role here. Next, we might take action 0 from state 4. As we receive rewards, we update our Q table to show the estimates of the state action returns. At some point, the table will converge to a set of values that no longer change in significant ways. At that point, we say that our agent is trained and has an understanding of the estimated returns for each action from each state. Now, say that we are running the agent and we are in state 1. We can look at our table to see the estimated returns for all of our possible actions. It's clear that action 0 will give us the greatest possible return, which, remember, includes the next and discounted sum of all future estimated rewards. So, we can choose action 0. This is known as picking the greedy action, as we're choosing the action with the highest estimated return. On the other hand, we might choose a different action completely randomly in order to explore new options to learn about the environment. This is like ordering something new off the menu just to see if we like it. Algorithms have different ways of balancing the exploitation and exploration options. That being said, if you are confident in your return estimates, you can just choose the greedy option every time rather than continuing to explore. Q tables are fairly straightforward, even if the math to generate them is complex. However, they suffer from a number of problems. The first is that they only work with discrete observation and action spaces. The second is that as the table grows, so do the memory and computational requirements to generate the table. If each state represents, say, one possible configuration of pieces on a chessboard, then you'd have billions and billions of states. 
Finally, with larger tables, it becomes intractable to visit every state action pair and estimate the return for that pair. The table does not give you a way to interpolate between values to guess at a state action value you might not know. Thanks to these issues, we turn to the land of model-free algorithms, function approximators, and deep Q learning. Here, we take in the observed values of our states, which can be continuous or discrete. This might be the four continuous values we plan to use for our cart poll problem. These values are fed as inputs to a function approximator, which is just some mathematical function that attempts to approximate some other function. In this case, we are trying to approximate Q values since we can't use the table. Many functions are possible here, but as it turns out, neural networks make great function approximators. This neural network is known as a deep Q network, as it's a neural network being used as a function approximator in Q learning. Note the two outputs of the neural network. As I mentioned, we want to estimate the Q values for each possible action. In our case, we only have two actions, push the cart left, or push the cart right. In deep Q learning, we train this neural network much like you would in supervised learning. By exploring the environment, actual rewards are recorded and used as ground truth values during training. With some luck and hyperparameter tweaking, the neural network should be able to predict the Q value for each action, given a set of observations. Note that you will often see the terms observation and state used interchangeably here, as the observation values usually describe a particular state. Once you have the estimated Q values for your action, you can simply choose the highest value for your greedy action, or choose something else if you want to explore. A quick note about terminology. Since nearly the beginning of reinforcement learning research, the term model has been used to indicate the environment dynamics. Remember that a model-free algorithm does not need to discover all the probabilities and transitions in a given Markov decision process, but we assume that a model still exists for our environment. However, in supervised learning, a model refers to the mathematical set of functions used to predict or infer some outputs given some inputs. In deep learning, this is usually a neural network. In reinforcement learning, on the other hand, this is called a function approximator, as it's used to approximate things like Q values, even though it operates much like the models in supervised learning. Now, with all that high-level theory out of the way, let's get our hands dirty and actually train a reinforcement learning agent. RL agents can be very sensitive to hyperparameters. That means changing one little thing can make the agent suddenly not work or find some local optimum where it performs some useless activity. As a result, I highly recommend seeking out hyperparameters for many of these toy environments when you are first starting out. It will help you see success faster, and then you can start tuning the settings or tweaking the environment from there. We're going to use the Deep Q network from Stable Baselines 3. If you go to the Stable Baselines 3 documentation, go to the RL algorithms, you can read all about DQN and how to use it, along with the action and observation space requirements. For example, the actions need to be discrete, but the observations can be discrete or continuous. Here's an example. In fact, we're going to base it on this example and set some custom parameters. The first thing we're going to do is set the policy. In this case, it's a multi-layer perceptron or MLP policy, also known as a neural network for our purposes. If you go to the stable baselines documentation and you look for policy networks, which is right here, and if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see an example of how they set a custom policy. In this case, they're also using MLP policy for that multi-layer perceptron, and they're setting the policy arguments, in this case, defining the layers of 64 units each. And this is for a custom actor and critic, which we're not using for DQN, so it's just going to be essentially one of these. Feel free to read through this page if you'd like to learn about how to set custom policies. In addition, we need to pass in our environment. We're going to set our learning rate to 0 0.0001, which is the default in this case. Something we didn't go over is the replay buffer of the 
deep Q network. A replay buffer just remembers previous steps and samples from it to try to figure out how to calculate a Q value. It's what's used to help train that neural network. There's entire papers on it, but we won't dive into the specifics of it. We then have learning starts, and this is the number of steps to take before the actual learning happens. If you notice, this cart pull problem is actually fairly quick. Within a few steps, it usually falls over. We're going to decrease this from the default of 50,000 to only 1,000. There's a lot of sensitivity that happens here. If you just went through with the default, you might find that learning never happens, or it takes a while to learn. Agents can be very sensitive to hyperparameters, so one little tweak here and there might mean the difference between an agent that works and an agent that does nothing or just fails completely. As a result, it can often be very helpful to search for hyperparameters to start with that other people have done in the past. After some searching, I found this example in the Stable Baselines 3 discussion. Somebody came up with these hyperparameters that are known to work with CartPole. This might not be the only set of hyperparameters that work, but it's a known good starting place. So for now, while you're learning, and for me as well as I'm continuing to learn this stuff, starting with known good hyperparameters that someone else has done, whether it's from a paper or somewhere else on the internet, is a good place to begin. We're going to be using their hyperparameters for training our agent. The batch size refers to the mini batch size, which is the number of samples we need to take, often from something like the replay buffer, before performing a gradient descent update on our neural network. The default is 32, and we're going to stick with that default. Next, we have the discount factor. As we saw, this is the amount multiplied to future rewards or future predicted rewards in order to discount them. Again, the default is 0.99, which means future rewards are almost worth the same as the next or current reward, and we're just going to stick with that default. Next is the number of steps to take before we perform an actual update to our parameters in the neural network. The default is four steps, which means a lot of learning happens with very few steps, or after only four steps, one of these updates happens. This can be very computationally expensive, and since cart pull is fairly simple, we're going to set this to 256, at least according to those hyperparameters that we looked at. So you see train frequency equals 256. That seems to work. That allows the environment to take a number of steps, in this case 256, prior to an update for those weights. A rollout refers to a simulation from the current state trying to predict the next possible actions in order to maximize a value or a return. The number of gradient steps here refers to the number of gradient steps or update to the neural network after each one of these rollouts. Normally one is performed, but we're going to set it to 128. I'm pulling the hyperparameter from this person's post. Once again, I have not played with this hyperparameter much to be able to tell you exactly what it affects, but it does seem to affect training, in this case, making it a little more stable. Something we didn't get into with DQN is this idea of a target network. DQN uses two neural networks that are copies of each other. One is a target network, one is the main network. The idea is that the target network's parameters aren't actually trained, but they're periodically synchronized or updated to match the parameters in the main Q network or the main neural network. This just sets how often that takes place. The default is 10,000 steps, but once again, this is a fairly short and simple environment, so we're just going to set this to 10. It's not arbitrary as I'm pulling it from someone else's known hyperparameter settings. The default neural network for this MLP policy is two hidden layers and one output layer. In this case, it's two layers of 64 nodes each, followed by that one output layer. And that output layer should have two nodes, one node for each of our actions or Q values for those actions left and right. According to this person, we should increase those nodes from 64 and 64 to 256 and 256. This makes it a more complex neural network. It will take more computational resources to train and use or make inference from in order to predict those Q values, but it does seem to converge on something that actually works for us. If you want insights into the training metrics, you can set verbose to something else like one or two, 
but the default is zero, which means don't print anything. We're going to print out our own metrics, which is a simplified version. If you go back to the stable baselines, go to DQN, you can see that there are many more hyperparameters that you can set, but these seem to be the main ones, as well as the ones that differ from the defaults taken from this person's post. Let's go ahead and initialize our model. We're going to divide up our training into a number of rounds so that we can take a video snapshot of what's happening in each of these rounds. Normally you wouldn't do this, you would just do your training in one giant shot while monitoring the metrics throughout the training process. But for the sake of making this interesting and visually appealing, we're going to stop every so often, in fact number of steps per round, take a snapshot in video format of what's going on with the model so you can see training happening. I'm going to say in real time, but the reality is it's going to be a recorded video. Just as we did before, we're going to create our recorder. We're going to use the new video file name, which is the 2-training.mp4. We're going to use the same 4cc4 letter code, frames per second, and resolution that we set in a previous cell. We're then going to use a simple for loop for each of our rounds, and we're going to record the average episode lengths and average episode rewards during those rounds so that we can plot it later and see what training looks like. Ideally, those should be going up as training improves our agent. Then we're going to call model.learn. Remember that we set the model here, which is DQN. So if we go here, we should be able to look for the learn method, which is right here. So we have model, we're going to call the learn method. And you can see the parameters that it expects and gives us a train model as an output. It's usually a good idea to save your model every so often in case something happens to training. And in addition, you can go back to a model that performed better. In supervised learning, you'll often find that models will get better over time and sometimes reach a point of overfitting. But in this case, in reinforcement learning, you might see a model do very well and then completely forget what it was doing and find some local maximum and just do nothing, And in which case it helps to go back to the better model and use that. We're going to save it as model file name base, which is cartpole-dqn, and the round number. So you should have a number of saved models in your file system. So you should have a number of saved models in your file system when this training process is done. Note that what I'm doing here with the rounds is not the normal way to use stable baselines. The better way to use it is to use these callbacks, which you can read about in their documentation. The most common one is this on-step callback. Every step, this callback gets called. And what you can do is say, hey, every 10,000 steps, save my model. While this is the normal way to use it, I prefer to teach using this way. This makes a little sense of train the model for a little bit, save the model, test the model. It's just not what's recommended for stable baselines. After we've saved the model from that training, we're then going to test the model with several episodes. In this case, we're going to use 100 episodes. On the very first test, we're going to record it and add that to our video so you can watch what's happening. But for all 100 tests, we are going to record the episode length and episode total rewards. We're then going to accumulate those average lengths and rewards so that we can plot them later. Then we're going to compute the average as all we've done previously is just accumulate them for each episode. We're going to divide by the number of tests for each of those rounds in order to compute the average. Then we're going to append those averages to arrays so that we can plot it and see how those averages, the lengths and the rewards, change for each round. Finally, we're going to close out the video writer so that this can all be stored and we can watch it later. Let's run it. Note that this might take a few minutes, so we will just sit here patiently. Okay, it looks like we're getting a warning here, so I'm gonna stop execution. This is the one that I showed earlier. You're calling step even though the environment has already been terminated. I think we missed something with one of our tests. Let me take a look here. So it's probably within test, so it looks like it's stuck here. As I predicted, it was getting stuck in test module. And if we go up to test module, where we have run while true, uh, I have an indentation error. If you notice, these are actually underneath if video, which was working for us earlier when we were always recording video. But if no video object was sent to this, 
it gets stuck here because it never returns because I'm stuck in a while true. So let's decrease the indent for that so that these run regardless of whether we have a video object or not. So we'll run that cell again. These should not change because we were always using a video object. So let's go back down to where we were training and run that again. I'm now gonna let this run for a few minutes. All right, so after about six and a half minutes, we finally have our training done that went over all of the rounds. Notice that the average test length is the same as the average test reward. That's because the rewards are given at plus one for every time step. So in this case, the reward should equal the length for every single episode. Note that this is not always the case for, in fact, most reinforcement learning environments you'll be working with. You might give negative rewards for things or more than one or fractions of a point. It just so happens in this case, our rewards are going to be the same as the length. You can see here that the lengths and the rewards went up some and then came back down. In fact, what better way to view this than to graph it? And as predicted, as the rounds increased from 0 to 20, you'll notice that the average episode length, as well as the reward, increased to some generic plateau and then plummeted the model kind of forgot what it was doing or explored into a new area and got to some sort of local optimum that really wasn't as good as previous learned attempts. Again, note that these are average episode lengths and rewards. That's because for each round, we send it through 100 test episodes in order to get a better understanding of what the model is doing and to better test it. You can make this 1,000 if you wanted to get an even better average. Since we closed out that video writer, we should be able to download the training and see what happened. So let's download that 2-training.mp4 and we will open it up in VLC. So we see it actually is trying decently well at first. The first round or the second round, it worked pretty well, but then it starts to lose it towards the end. It's getting a little better. And it's not quite getting there despite its best attempts here. So round like five, I think it should be the best possible one. There's still some wobbling back and forth, but that's pretty solid. You see it slowly moves off to the side there. And then as we get to the end here, you can see it really starts to fail. The model was forgetting what it was doing. Now for a really good model, we should be seeing these numbers over 300, maybe approaching 400 time steps. None of these are particularly great. So I'm going to run this whole thing a couple of more times to see if I can get some outputs that match that. Let's start here. As you can see, this round was much better. There's a few full 500 episode lengths, which is the maximum set before it truncates or times out. That indicates that we have something that should work as a solution for us. Note that if you were going to do this and you need to run this cell multiple times, each time you run this cell, it's using the parameters that are already in the model. So if you want to reset those parameters, you need to run the cell above it first, which overwrites the model variable or the model object. There's a bit of a joke in the reinforcement learning community that says something to the effect of random seeds are hyperparameters. This is referring to the fact that in many papers, in addition to seeing the hyperparameters like this when training a model, there will also be a random seed that is set to a particular value. This is to ensure that training converges in a predictable and deterministic way, because as you just saw, when we ran this previously, we did not get a full solution, and now we are. So this is what I was referring to when I said there's a little bit of luck involved. Once you find a seed that works, it's probably a good idea to publish that seed. I'm not using a seed so that you can see how random this is, but after recreating the model and training it a few times, you should get something that works for this very simple problem. Let's plot this again. 
And sure enough, we've got a few of these 500s that work very well for us. In fact, we are going to go with, I don't know, let's go with this round 18. That's something that should work pretty well. But before we do that, let's download the training video again and see what that looks like. Let's wait just a moment while it downloads. We'll open it up and we'll play it in VLC. You can see it being pretty terrible up front up until we get about halfway through where it really starts to balance. And if we skip to that round, you can see it oscillating here. If we skip to that round 17 or 18, you can see it at a full solution where it balances it quite well. It's not oscillating a whole lot. This looks like it's working very well, and I'm quite happy with these results. Here's 18, it oscillates a little bit. And if we go with, yeah, 18 is what we're gonna go with. So that looks like it works. 19, it's oscillating a good bit. So we'll go with 18. For the final testing, we're gonna choose the model that performed best. For us, that's gonna be model 19. Take a look at the file name. So that's cartpole-dqn underscore 19. Don't worry about that .zip, we just want that base file name, and that's what we've got here. We're going to test using this model. We're going to load it first and test with it and save that test to a new video. Lucky for us, Stable Baselines has a way to save and load models, but note that it's within the specific model class. So the DQN, we can save and load from there. So we're going to call the load method and give it that model file name. Once again, note there's no .zip. So that's gonna load in this underscore 19 model. We're gonna create a new video recorder. We're going to call the file name 3-testing.mp4 and pass in those other arguments that we set earlier. Then we're gonna test the model. We're only gonna run one episode. Feel free to encapsulate this in a for loop and run a bunch of episodes if you want to calculate, say, average reward and average length. But we're just going to call that test model function that we created earlier. We're going to pass in the environment, this model that we loaded, the handle to our video object, and the model file name, which we're going to print in the video so we can remember which one we're using. If you wanted to send a model to somebody, you would just send this .zip and they could load it like this and start using it as an agent to perform whatever action it's been trained for. And finally, we'll close out the video writer. We'll run this. It should take just a moment. And as we predicted earlier, we got an episode length of 500 and a reward of 500, which is the max given the timeout of the cart pole. If you go to the cart pole documentation, you can see that indeed, the episode truncates whenever the length is greater than 500. It's always a good idea to close out the environment when you're done, so env.close. Now that we're done, let's download our testing video. That should be pretty quick. Let's fire that up in VLC. And sure enough, we see our agent successfully balancing the pole on the cart. In fact, it continues all the way to the end and correcting for any little tilts here or there. I hope this helps you get started with reinforcement learning, as well as using gymnasium and stable baselines to train your own agents. While it can be a lot of fun, keep in mind that reinforcement learning is generally really hard. As I mentioned, agents can be very sensitive to hyperparameters, and training can take a long time, like hours or days. Alex Erpan, a reinforcement learning researcher at Google, has this fantastic blog post that explains how RL is not a magic bullet. While it's a few years old, the points are still very much valid. In most cases today, classical approaches to problems, like control theory, are almost always better. But RL is a fascinating area of research, and it's constantly getting better. Here's a challenge for you. I want you to solve the inverted pendulum problem that's built into gymnasium. For the environment, it means just swapping out cart pole for pendulum. However, note that this environment uses a continuous action space instead of a discrete one. And DQN does not work well with continuous action spaces. That means you'll likely need to find a different algorithm to use. 
The goal is to get the pendulum to stand upright as straight as possible and use as little force as necessary to keep it there. You're welcome to look up hyperparameters to use for this environment as it will make your life much easier. I'll make sure to post a link to my solution in the description. Reinforcement learning is a very difficult subject and is still very much an active area of research. It promises to solve a number of tough problems, including giving us things like self-driving cars and self-flying planes. It's a lot of fun to play with as it feels like you're building a real AI that does something rather than just predict values or classes, even though that's kind of part of RL. That being said, good luck and happy hacking. Bye.